And that takes me to my um, conclusion chapter. Next step, so what's what's next? What what do we do uh, after? Like, how do I get started uh, to containerize my applications? So, like, if, if I were to uh, briefly meet someone in an elevator and they ask me, okay, I've been, I've been tasked to containerize a bunch of apps, uh, what should I do first? Uh, my response wouldn't be immediately, oh, just install Kubernetes. No. The first thing is, like, my, my personal roadmap is start by containerizing one application. And to containerize one application, you start by containerizing one specific service uh, for that application. Maybe you write a Docker file, or maybe you use another mechanism. And once you have containerized one service in one application, you containerize the rest of the application. And then my personal preference, again, is to use Compose. Because remember this morning, uh, to bring up the Docker Coins application, all I had to do was git clone, Docker Compose up. And I argue that this is one of the simplest ways we have so far to bring a complex applications up and running. Uh, all you need is a local Docker installation uh, in on Windows and Macs and even on Linux. That's really easy now. Uh, and with just like these two commands, clone the repo, Docker compose up, you wait a few minutes and you get the, the whole app up and running. This was like a five services app, but uh, you can do the same thing for apps that have like 100, 200 services. Maybe it will take like 10 or 15 minutes to get everything up and running, um, but um, it, it will work and it work, it will work very reliably. If you look at the repo and you look at the Docker coins directory, you know, like, okay, what did change in that specific directory? Like, I, I never remember the exact command, but you know, like some uh, git log with the right parameters. You will see that the code of Docker coins was written in June 2015. It hasn't changed by a single line since then. Like nothing. Uh, if you look at the Docker files, you will see that they have changed slightly because when I wrote this demo app in 2015, um, we, we didn't have the Alpine base image. And at some point I wanted to have smaller images. So I replaced uh, the like Python image with the Python Alpine so that we have smaller images, etc., etc. But other than that, nothing changed. So that app, we could already bring it up uh, three years ago um, by cloning a repo and doing Compose Up. Three years later, the same app, same code, nothing changed. We can still bring it up. I, I think that's pretty nice. So once we have that, uh, we can empower our development teams to use containers locally, like in, develop in development. At that point, we can think about setting up CI and CD. Sorry, CI first. <laughs> then we could set up CD for staging. That means each time I push something to my repo, uh, I'm going to automatically deploy that on a staging environment. Uh, and all that can be done without even having to worry and think about Kubernetes and orchestration, etc. Because all these things like uh, development environment, uh, CI, CD to staging, all this can be, do, can be done on, uh, on, on single machines. And then, once we start thinking about production, uh, then we can look at orchestration. So this, this is fairly important because I've seen many teams uh, start first with the orchestration part while they had not even started building images yet. And I'm like, this, again, just my opinion, but this is all wrong. Uh, if you don't have images, it's, it's too early to look at orchestration. Because that once you have your nice orchestrator, you're like, okay, now how do we build images? Uh, um, how do we get started? Like, what should be our first production cluster? Um, in my humble opinion, that's going to be a managed cluster. I remember what I said this morning. The best way to deploy Kubernetes is to get somebody else to do it for us. Um, for the first production cluster, I think that that's the best option. Then later, as you pick up more operational experience, and you see what are the bottlenecks and the, what kind of issue you run into, then you can make a more informed decision about, do I, can I stay with this option or should I run my own clusters or should I switch to a different provider? But making that kind of decision before um, having seen a little bit how your app behaves, I think it's a little bit hurry. Uh, is it better to have one big cluster or many small ones? 
at first, uh, in theory, the idea is like, yeah, use one big cluster so that you can have economies of scale and so that you can, uh, for instance, have a prod and pre-prod together on the same cluster so that, for instance, when you are, uh, you, you, you can uh, burst the, the capacity and if production needs more space, it will automatically kick out uh, pre-production and you can make significant uh, economies of, of scale. Um, now, in practice, many people realize, well, it's better to have multiple smaller clusters because it's easier to manage. Uh, you have a smaller blast radius. If, if something bad happens, like some auto scaling goes crazy and you end up with hundreds of pods and everything goes down, it's better to have smaller clusters, especially in the beginning as your kind of, as your operational, as your ops team is picking up ops skills on, on Kubernetes, it's, it's better to do that with smaller environments. Um, namespaces. So we haven't, we, we haven't seen much uh, about namespaces, but I, I mentioned that a few times. Um, if you need to deploy multiple applications or multiple versions of an application, you can create different namespaces for that. Um, I added here, so in the last chapter, you have links to, uh, to a, uh, to a, a longer two-day uh, tutorial. Uh, and so I, I, I put links to the relevant chapters. Uh, so the chapter about namespaces, network policies to isolate the containers, role-based access control, to define who can do what on the cluster. Stateful services. Uh, so when people ask me, hey, how do I get my database on Kubernetes? Um, I would say my, my answer would be don't, especially if the question was about my database. If you just have one database, I think there is no advantage, no gain in putting that into Kubernetes. Now, if the question is my databases, because I have many of them, like tens, hundreds, maybe in, then like, okay, then it could be interesting to put that into Kubernetes because you can use the, like the, the, the management facilities, like the, the effect of like mass of, of Kubernetes to, to host all that. Um, so if you just have like a couple of databases, just leave them outside of the cluster. It's, it's easier and you can still uh, access them uh, using external name, um, and, and it will be transparent for the services running on the cluster. Uh, now, if you have many databases and you want to manage them with Kubernetes, uh, you will need to read about uh, volumes, uh, stateful sets, and persistent volumes. And there again, I added links to the relevant chapters. Um, HTTP traffic handling. There is something called ingresses that lets you... Um, associate virtual hosts with services. So if you want to expose HTTP traffic, that can be really useful. Uh, okay, so we've talked about logging and we talked about metrics. About um, application configuration, um, the, um, there are a couple of constructs that are really useful for that, config maps and secrets. Uh, config maps and secrets let you capture um, a configuration file or a bunch of configuration files, store them in the Kubernetes API, and then transform them back uh, into files uh, running, uh, I mean, files located in the pods. Um, and again, I've put a link to the relevant section. Uh, then stack deployments. Um, at When you get started, uh, it's great to start with kubectl run, kubectl create deployment, like these commands. Uh, it's fairly simple. It's, it's fairly easy to, to get a, a quick result. But really quickly, you will want to put more customizations and more parameters, uh, and you will want to have custom YAML. I don't expect that people write YAML completely from scratch, but you will, for instance, generate the YAML for a deployment and then tweak it, customize it a little bit. So then you will want that YAML to be stored in repos. Uh, there is a trend called GitOps, um, which it's basically infrastructure as code, but applied uh, to, to Kubernetes, um, or rather it's, uh, it's, it's a generalization of infrastructure as code. Um, so the idea is that you store all the YAML uh, for your application uh, in, a, in a Git repo, and when you want to make changes, instead of doing kubectl this, kubectl that, kubectl edit, you make changes in the repo, submit a pull request, 
and when you merge the pull request, then the changes get applied. Uh, so that lets you uh, track the changes made to the environment uh, using the git history. Um, then there are a few other tools that you can use. Helm, which is a package manager for Kubernetes. Uh, Spinnaker, which is the CD, the continuous delivery platform used by Netflix. So it has support for blue green deployments, canary deployment, and much more. Um, all these things are to be seen as a kind of a progression through different steps. So, um, an example is like, um, a couple of years ago, I talked to a team who told me, oh, we looked at Helm, but it, it was a nightmare and we decided to not use it. It was too complicated. And then less than six months later, uh, when we talked again, we were like, oh, now we're using Helm and we're happy with it. And what happened is that, yeah, if you start immediately with Helm, it's, it's, there are so much like new things and complexity, et cetera, that's like, no, this is too much. But if you, if you just like step back to something simpler, um, like just having like plain YAML files, at some point you want to add templates to YAML files to customize them. And at some point you, you hit the point where you, you can use the value of Helm. Um, and, and so that, and at some point you can, um, um, when, when, <coughs> sorry, um, once you kind of, um, go beyond what Helm does, that's when you can look at something like Spinnaker. Um, okay, I think, uh, last item, which is fairly important, developer experience. Um, so when you start working with Kubernetes in a team, make sure that, uh, you have clear answers to these questions, among others. Uh, how do you onboard some, someone new? Like, how do they get started? How do they get, uh, their dev environment? Uh, how, how do the, uh, change in the code goes from dev to prod? Um, a, a, a pattern that I've seen many times in many teams is where there is, um, how to call that, a, a team that kind of scouts and goes ahead and starts using containers and Kubernetes and they do that for maybe three months, six months, they do a POC, they go to production for some apps and then everybody is happy and they're like, okay, now everybody else does the same and there is a huge gap between that team and everybody else. And so that team is talking about pods and uh, and, and deployments and made and having YAMLs in the repos, etc. And everybody else is like, what the hell is this? I, how does this work? Um, so what I want everybody is to be aware of is that after um, one day, like learning all these things, um, now there is probably a significant, a significant gap with the rest of your team. So when you go back to your teams and start implementing containers and Kubernetes, etc., be aware of that and be aware that these teams will, will need to catch up and that you, you need to make sure that, um, that to mind the gap basically.